Hello, my name is Sue Honoré. Uh, apart from my main job, I work as the Oxfordshire Family History Society Journal Editor. But one of the other things I do is I'm co-administrator with Richard Merry, who's based in Australia, of the Oxfordshire DNA Project. And our project's been going for a couple of years, and I was just going to share some of my experiences with you. Our group has been going now for, as I say, just over two years. We have about 69 members at the moment. Mostly um, there are people who are tracing their Oxfordshire surname, so about 75% of the tests we've got are, are male. Um, and we, we're pretty good because we've got seven of them up at 111 markers. But we'll take anybody as long as they've got Oxfordshire ancestry. And we've got some mitochondrial tests and family finder tests, as well as some much deeper DNA tests, which is great, things like the big Y. We have a range of surnames so far. Um, they're listed here. It would be great to actually have lots more people with the same surname, as well as uh, some of the sur Oxfordshire surnames that we know are absolutely missing, very common Oxfordshire surnames, things like uh, Blake, Locke, Busby, Maisie, and even some of the more unusual ones like Sparrowhawk um, or Norwich. It would be great to have those real deep Oxfordshire surnames. I was thinking about the sort of questions that I get asked as an administrator of a DNA project. And I think my most common answer is find a man. <laughs> and this is because we have to explain the DNA tests to everybody. And the most common question we get asked is, I'm female, uh, I want to trace my surname. And you have to go through the fact that you need a man. You actually need to find a man. And I'll come back to some examples of that later. Lots and lots of other questions come to us, all sorts of things. Uh, as I say, a lot of them are around trying to make things clearer. And you really, really find out that to most people, DNA is very, very complicated. And I really think it's important to all of us who work in the field of uh, managing DNA and explaining DNA that we need to educate. We need to make sure that we can communicate very, very simply and clearly what some of the test results mean. This is far more than just price. Price is coming down, it's getting better, it's becoming more affordable for more people. So there are fewer queries, I think, to us about price than there were in the past. But it really is about why is this information so complicated? Can you help me understand it? So whether that's through software tools or through uh, just sitting down with somebody and explaining or creating something online that people can read, it really is important that we educate people. Otherwise, we will not get more people having DNA tests. Uh, one of the other questions that I get asked quite a lot, um, for which my answer is, you need both, is, doesn't DNA replace paper? I just need one or I just need the other. And in reality, I do think you need both. You need to be able to match both up and understand where they coincide and where there might be differences and where that might lead you. So uh, people cannot tend to just have a DNA test and get an instant result unless it's something simple like a paternity test. And equally, uh, you can't just research paper nowadays. You will find that there's some quite interesting things that come out via um, looking at the, both the paper and the DNA. So what I really recommend is that you combine uh, your paper and physical research, uh, oral interviews, along with DNA testing, and just add in a good dose of common sense uh, to cross-check facts and make sure that they make sense, or trying to puzzle out why things have come up the way they have, but also some patience, because none of this is instant, and you may have to wait some time 
I mean, often even years before something comes back that's going to help you. Now I'm going to take you through four examples that I have from my experience uh, about DNA testing, just to show the types of things that we're finding, but also how far along we are. Uh, the first one is Harris. Now in our Oxfordshire DNA project, we've actually got three Harris people. Uh, for those of you who don't understand Oxfordshire, um, I live in a village called Minster Lovell, actually, which uh, is well known for that famous uh, monarch who ended up in a car park in Leicester. Um, the Francis Lovell was Chancellor to uh, Richard III. Two miles down the road is a village called Astle. Uh, for those of you who know the Mitfords, then you might know the name of Astle. And three miles further down the road is Burford. And all three of these places are on uh, the road known as the A40 in various guises at the moment, uh, which has been there for a very, very long time. Um, it's essentially a prehistoric east-west road running from Wales all the way down to London. And also these three villages are along the River Windrush which once upon a time was navigable. So there was a fair amount of movement around in this area. Our three people that we have so far with the Harris surname, uh, all of the men have been tested at at least 67 markers. And I haven't shown all 67 here, but I've shown the ones where there are differences. And as you can see highlighted in yellow, the Minster Lovell Harris is very, very different from the other two. The other two have only two marker differences. Uh, the Minster level one is very, very different. So in that space of literally five miles where you might assume that very small villages which back in time had 60, 80 people in them, maybe 100, um, you would expect possibly that anybody with a surname of Harris might be related. But it really looks like we've got two lines of Harris's in this very small area. Why two groups? Well, there's the famous non-paternal event. Uh, it's possibly there's some Ill illegitimacies there. Um, there is another surname called Aeris, which is spelt in various different ways and even extends to Ayres, as in Pam Ayres, who comes from Oxfordshire. Uh, and it may be that this is a branch that, that is slightly different from the Harris branch. But equally, it's possible that in this small area, uh, you just had totally unrelated groups of people turned up and landed in the same space. So we don't know about the Harrises, and certainly you can't come to any conclusions with only three people. So it would be fantastic if we could get uh, a lot more Harrises from Oxfordshire tested, and we could possibly see where we think things are going. What we do, uh, and I'm working with somebody on this, is we've been taking all the baptisms that Oxfordshire Family History Society has electronically and using them to map surnames by century. Uh, going back into the 1500s, which is when we've got the earliest baptisms. And from that, we can sort of look at some of the hotspots for surnames over time. Now, there need to be a lot of improvements to this. This is only at its first stages. Uh, you can see, for example, here in Oxford that there's a, a, a very dark area but that's mainly because there are more people in Oxford. We haven't quite got this proportional yet. What is important is to notice that way up um, just north, of, between Chipping Norton and Banbury, around the Deddington area, there is one hotspot of Harris, and that is a very small local area, uh, no big conurbations. And so that's quite important. That means that there are quite a lot of Harrises that came from that area. And equally in the west of Oxford, around the Whitney area, which is where those three examples I showed you earlier come from, you can see there are a lot of darker areas. And Harris is very much a West Oxfordshire surname. So it would be great to be able to try and do a lot more work tracing Harris's and trying to find their origins. 
And long term, we'll look at trying to pull in more than just baptisms, and we can get some really great maps of Oxfordshire, uh, tracing all the surnames that we have in our DNA group. So everybody who can join will actually help us do this research. Uh, the next example is actually another person who's a member of our DNA group, and it concerns the surname Templar, uh, going back possibly to the Knights Templar. Uh, so this lady had done extensive paper research uh, back to John Templar, who was born about 1540, but she did not know where. He did marry in 1566 in West Hanney in Oxfordshire, or on the Oxfordshire-Berkshire border, and uh, lived in Oxfordshire for the whole of his life. He moved to Wooden by Woodstock uh, when he was uh, in middle age, and his family lived there for many, many generations, and it's only when farming started to get in trouble in the mid-19th century that the descendants moved to London. So the Templar family has been in Oxfordshire for quite a long time, but origins unknown. Uh, this lady has gone through just about everything she could possibly do. She's done some very thorough research, going through parish records, wills, right back to manorial records, and the best guess that she could come up with was that the Templars actually came from Devon. So she came to see us and said, will DNA help? Well, you can imagine what my answer was in that case with her being female. It was, find a man. Her problem was that she had no immediate living males. Uh, quite often someone will have brothers or fathers or uncles or even descendants of grandparents that they can actually persuade to have a DNA test. But she had nobody, and she actually had to go back four generations before she could even start working forward. And she worked forward on every single line, trying to find descendants of John Templar, who was born in uh, 1842 in London. And eventually, after hitting a number of uh, dead ends, with the family dying out in terms of males, she found two potential people. She used modern records to be able to trace these people, um, telephone directories, online listings of people, um, voting lists, electoral rolls, etc. And she found two potential people. And she wrote two letters, and it was really difficult, and I think it is difficult for many people, to be able to somehow write a persuasive letter to someone saying, you don't know me, uh, you've never heard of me before probably, I'm maybe a distant cousin of yours and I really need you to be tested for DNA. She wrote to these two people and almost instantly one came back saying no. And you have to respect that and say, fine, we're not going to get anywhere with this one. And she had a long pause, nothing happened, and she thought that DNA possibly wasn't the way forward for her. But the other person came back and said, yes, why not? Which was fantastic. So um, this man was tested. And unfortunately, it came back with no immediate matches. So she came back to us and said, what should I do? And we went off again and said, oh, find some more men. Uh, she did know of somebody who'd done a lot of tracing of a Templar family with E in it rather than an A. Uh, basically based in 16th century Somerset, and they had had a descendant who moved to Devon called Richard Templar. Uh, this man was up for testing, so uh, she said, that's great, you know, let's get you tested. And he said, well, actually, I know somebody else who believes that there was a non-paternal event. He believes he's a Templar, even though he doesn't have a Templar surname. And in fact, this other man had already had a DNA test. So she went from zero DNA tests to potentially three. And they got the results back from the man um, in the West Country and from the one who, who believed that he was a Templar. And none of the three agree. So now we have three Templars tested. Uh, but no connections between any of them. And in fact, um, there are different haplogroups, which you know quite a big difference. So we've got a very rare surname here. And 
at the moment no DNA connections. So it's really important for people with rare surnames to actually be tested because there are a lot of people out there waiting uh, patiently in the hope that they will find a match somewhere and will be able to trace their origins. So it's not all wonderful instant good luck stories, but this lady's very persistent and I'm sure she will find the origins of her Templar family at some stage. The final two examples are personal. Uh, my maiden surname is Haig. Uh, our family has always spelt it without an H and in fact has always declared through many, many generations that we don't spell it with an H like those people from Yorkshire. Uh, but I've never been able to prove that we are actually of the Scottish branch of the family where it is spelt without the H on the end. And whether I am related to uh, Douglas Haig of World War I fame or to the whiskey. Well, I'm going to tell you two of the examples of some of the research that we've done within my family. Uh, my ancestor, on paper I can trace back to, is Joseph Haig, who was born about 1750 in Stainland in West Yorkshire. Uh, there were quite a lot of Haigs around at the time there, and we're the product of his second marriage, so it's really quite difficult, although I'm trying very hard with the one name study of the area to trace uh, his first marriage and some of his children by both the first and second marriage. But my descendant of his is his son John Haig, who was born in Stainland and was in the army for most of his life, ending up in Edinburgh. He was with the uh, 1st Battalion of the Royal Scots Guards. Going right down to my father, um, who is still living and uh, although he was born in Madrid, he's not Spanish, his father was working out there at the time. Now when I first had my father tested, the results came back and I was expecting to have matches with Hague's. Well actually there is only one, um, uh, someone whose ancestor was born in Oldham in Lancashire in about 1805, but we also found some closer matches with someone called Rhodes, uh, who's my closest match at 67 markers, someone called Marsden, who goes back to Preston Burnley area, and someone that I will call Mr. Smith, that's not his real name, but he didn't want his name revealed, and he goes back to 18th century Yorkshire near Stainland. And we've got a few other matches at, at 37 markers that do have tendency towards Hague, like Haig spelled H-A-G-U-E and Hayes, whatever. But my matches were very few and far between, and not only that, there virtually wasn't any match with a Haig, which was quite interesting. Now there is um, a well-known story that the Hagues in Yorkshire came from the Hagues of Beamerside in the borders. Uh, there is a book written in 1881 called The Hagues of Beamerside. You mustn't always trust Victorian writers of family history, but the Hague family are, were fairly wealthy, have good family documentation, and within that book and within their records, there is something that says, um, speaking of a man circa the 1590s, um, one of his ancestors many generations before uh, was a branch that broke off from the Scottish branch and moved to Yorkshire. And I always thought that potentially this branch went down to an area north of Barnsley. Um, for those of you on the M1 who know the Hay Roundabout in that area, uh, that's where I thought the family may have gone to if it was one of these ones that had emigrated. But um, as we've seen from our matches, we've got some Lancashire matches and there is a place north of Wigan which is called Haig and there are quite a few Haigs there. And my group, which is the middle one here, actually comes from Stainland area and there are uh, quite a few Haigs in that area. It's a very, very common name. So the question is, um, is it possible that this 
uh, item written in the family records of the Hagues of Bemerside is true? And if so, is it possible that there were one or more migrations or some cousins came together or somebody came south to Yorkshire and then various members of the family moved around? That is yet to be proven. Uh, looking at the 1881 maps, uh, because I haven't got baptism records for the whole of Yorkshire as I do for Oxfordshire, um, the Scottish Hague in the Midlothian and Borders does go back to uh, the 1100s and the Beamerside Hagues have good records from 1412 and Mr Smith um, does have some ancestry that's Scottish but not quite in the same areas. It is a Norman name uh, and they are spread all over the place, including Yorkshire, however. But when we look at the other names that I've got on my match list, uh, and if you look at Hague with an H, Rhodes and Marsden, they all go back to um, the Yorkshire, Lancashire area and they all go back to medieval records, whether that's poll tax records or tithes or hundreds rolls. So those families have been around for quite a time, and almost from Norman times, medieval times forward. So it is potential that, that our Hagues and Rhodes and Marstons are connected in that Yorkshire area. And this is where using both uh, DNA and paper really helps to trace your family. I have yet to find out what my connection is, whether I am connected to the Hagues up in Scotland, and also we have yet to trace the exact connection between us, for those of us who have got matches in this area. Um, there was a vicar called Rhodes in the village of Stainland for many, many years, a nonconformist vicar, but who knows, we have yet to find that out, so that's one of those mysteries to be solved, and I'd love more people to come forward with the surname Hague to see if we can actually do that. In addition to doing um, a 67 marker test on my father, um, when family tree DNA were beta testing the big Y test, I decided that would be a great idea and got my father to do yet another swab. And it came up that we were U106. And for him, that was really quite interesting. You could then start talking about going from the Y chromosome Adam in East Africa um, very commonly for Europe were haplogroup R, arising in Asia, going through the Asian steppe, and gradually coming out into Central Europe. And U106 is less common, but we're talking about being in Central Europe, moving from the Caspian Sea, Black Sea area around 5,000 years ago. Uh, these numbers keep changing, but there are about 1,500 people who are actually uh, part of the U106 group. And I think it is quite interesting for people to understand that when you get DNA tested, most people think they join a surname group, for example. But beyond surname groups, there are um, geographical groups like our Oxfordshire group, but now more and more there are essentially DNA clustering groups of haplogroups or subclades, so people can join multiple groups. And I'm certainly very, very impressed with the guys in the U106 group because it's a group of uh, very keen men who are fascinated at studying um, the U106 group and are coming up with all sorts of ideas and thoughts uh, and clever bits and pieces to do with the group. Uh, it's well beyond me. I can't do all the research they can but I'm happy to contribute where I can. And I have said, if there's anything simple that you want me to do, then, then um, do call on me. Now, Ian MacDonald has been very, very active in this area. And this chart um, that he's produced gets updated on a regular basis. This one is very new, very fresh, just come out, and actually shows um, the breakdown of U106 and I think it's fascinating to be able to look at it not just in detail but to stand back and see the periods in time when there was rapid expansion where people were possibly migrating, um, interbreeding, 
being successful in whatever they were successful at, such as farming, uh, and, and seeing when the, the group really began to expand. You will notice way, way over on the uh, left-hand side of this diagram is a, a, a cluster of uh, grey subclades, very, very ancient subclades. And uh, where that little arrow is, uh, that's where us Hagues are. Uh, I'll explain that now. Uh, so we're a very ancient group. We don't seem to have bred an awful lot. We don't seem to have expanded. We seem to be fairly rare. Um, when I had my father tested, it, they came back and said, well, you're in 106. And um, within that, there's a, a fairly exclusive little group called FGC 3861 uh, with uh, what is now 54 people, but there were much fewer then. And they said, Mr. Haig's out on a branch all by himself. There is just no match, uh, which was quite sad. We are obviously rare. I'm not quite sure what happened with our ancestors, but they weren't into, into doing lots of uh, expanding and breeding. And then back in August, September 2014, there was a big flurry of discussion amongst the people in the U106 group. And they said, there's somebody else who looks like they potentially might fit into FCG 3861, and he might possibly be the closest match to Mr. Haig. So I instantly contacted the U106 group and said, right guys, is there anything I can do? And they said, well, we need him to join the group. And I said, no problem, <laughs> leave that one to me, that I can do. So I contacted this man and said, we'd really, really like you to join the group and you might be you know, distantly connected to me and it's very rare and we'd love to have you. And surprisingly, about 10 minutes later, um, there was another little flurry of emails going on within the U106 group. He's joined! So I felt very proud that actually I could contribute something to helping uh, with the DNA research. And this man who's joined, um, Andy Reichel, is German. His family, as far as he knows, has been in Germany all its life. Uh, and there are now only two of us in this little group within FCG 3861. And we're now proudly called A1243. So there's two of us. Um, in the whole world that we know of, within at least within family tree DNA, um, in this group, and it is quite interesting to say that 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 we think that that group uh, um, was in Central Europe. And Ian, Ian McDonald has done a lot of work on the sort of time estimates as to when U106 would have arisen, when that became FCG3861, and when our little group may have arisen. But the estimates are obviously only estimates because we've got, again, a very small sample size. And um, there are a lot of variables that we don't really know about at the moment. But it is fantastic to be able to begin to get a picture of where the family came from. So it looks like um, our little A1243 group arose somewhere between 2100 and 4800 years ago in the Rhine Valley. Um, there are only two of us, so that's the best estimate at the moment. But uh, that is, for me, quite fascinating to be able to say, uh, I can trace my family back to Yorkshire circa 1750 and I'm getting a bit stuck. Maybe there's somewhere in Scotland in the middle of this. But I can also trace it back to a common ancestor who was living in the Rhine Valley uh, maybe uh, 4,000 years ago. And for me, that DNA journey now needs to continue, hoping that more and more people will come along and help make that a clearer story. And maybe I can join those two groups up eventually. So those are four examples of the sorts of things that um, I've been involved in in DNA. And I hope it gives some simple stories. It doesn't go into some of the technology, but it's, it's some simple stories of the types of things that people are beginning to find. And some of these journeys that we're beginning to go on to discover what DNA can tell us uh, about ourselves. Certainly, uh, we would love more people to actually join the Oxfordshire uh, project within Family Tree DNA, and you can find that at Family Tree DNA slash public slash Oxfordshire. Uh, you need to have good Oxfordshire ancestry. For that, we say 
at least three generations uh, back into the 19th century and much earlier if you can. We are taking people who are right on the borders because, I mean, certainly we know that uh, the Berkshire, Oxfordshire uh, reorganization in the 1970s has nothing to do with people uh, reproducing. You know, it was an artificial border. So we take Berkshire people on the edge of current Oxfordshire, which includes some of old Berks, um, and Buckinghamshire, Northamptonshire, Gloucestershire, for example, if you are right on the border, we'll take you if you have good Oxfordshire ancestry. Um, we can be contacted by email at, at uh, dna at ofhs.org.uk. And the other thing is there is an Oxfordshire surname interest list, uh, which is run by a man called Paul Brazil. And uh, not only can you register your Oxfordshire surname interest in the hope that you can make connections with other people, but he and I have arranged a, a little, um, what I call my DNA dating service, which is if you are, for example, a female and are looking for males who could be tested with a certain surname in Oxfordshire, or if you're the last of your line, you think, and there might be some cousins that you'd like tested, um, you can essentially put a DNA appeal out saying, um, I'm looking for people to be DNA tested. Um, maybe if you are generous, you know, to be able to say you'll contribute towards costs or something like that. Uh, so Oxil is very useful not only for surname interests within Oxfordshire, but also for you registering a DNA interest, and that's free. Obviously, um, we want tons more Oxfordshire surnames, uh, such as Harris, such as Mary, Richard Mary, who runs the, the group. He has a very rare surname in Oxfordshire, and he's desperate for more cousins. Um, any other Oxfordshire surname, we would really like to grow that group from 69 to many hundreds so that we can do more research and, and, and actually show the ancestry of Oxfordshire people. And it's not an easy thing because it's one of those counties that people moved through, but if you've got some Oxfordshire ancestry go back, going back in time, we'd really appreciate you joining. And as I mentioned before, it's not just Y-DNA, we do mitochondrial DNA and Family Finder as well. And on a personal level, if there are any Hagues out there who uh, would like to be tested by Family Tree DNA, I'd really appreciate that to see if we can find any connections. Uh, and any other surname, Templar included, or anybody who happens to know that now they've had a test, they know they're um, U106, it'd be great if they joined the U106 group. It doesn't matter. I think the more people that are tested for DNA, even if you don't belong to any of these groups, the more that are tested, the better we can get uh, more knowledge on both DNA and on families and on history. So I'd really encourage people to be tested. And when I talk to people, sometimes people say, well, I don't understand DNA. I don't know if I'm really interested in that personally, but I'm the last of my line. And I actually say, DNA is really a legacy for the future. It is worth getting tested. Maybe you won't get any personal benefit, but it is something like uh, if somebody way back in the 1850s went and transcribed some very rare records that were deteriorating, you are so grateful to them 100, 200 years later. And this is a similar situation. It's saying, especially if you're the last of your line or there aren't many of you left, do get a DNA test because it might be valuable for somebody in the future. Thank you very much for listening to me.